up, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kofinas. Today, I speak with Fred Zwanica, a leader and innovator in the area of secondary education. He is the co-founder of three organizations that aim to catalyze a new generation of ethical, entrepreneurial leaders in Africa. The African Leadership Academy, the African Leadership Network, and the African Leadership University. A passionate entrepreneur, Fred also served as founder and CEO of Terra Education, a global education company that today provides leadership training to about 4,000 people annually at 46 sites in 20 countries. Prior to his work in education, Zwanika co-founded the biotech company Synexa Life Sciences with operations in Cape Town, Berlin, London, and Dublin. He has been recognized as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and was listed by Forbes magazine among the top 10 young men in Africa. He has an MBA from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, where he was named an R.J. Miller Scholar, a distinction awarded to the top 10% of each graduating class, and holds a B.A. in Economics and a minor in Mathematical Statistics from McAllister College. Fred, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks, Dimitri. Pleasure to be here. It was quite a job getting through your uh, bio there. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. How long have you been in New York? I've been here for about four days. Mm. Yeah. When do you go back? Well, I'm on a month tour. Oh, so really? From here, I'm going to Chicago and then to San Francisco and then London and then back to Minnesota. Chicago, San Francisco, London, and then back to Minnesota? Why, yeah. <laughs> why that? It's an interesting geographical route. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, I would have left after my trip to San Francisco, but sorry, and then just head out to London. But I'm the commencement speaker at graduation this year at McAllister College, okay. where I went to college. Oh, that's nice. Is that and, the first uh, time you've done that for them? Yes, my first time, and then I'm also getting an honorary doctorate from them. So, Oh, that's very nice. I kind of have to come back for that. When did you graduate from McAllister? In 99. 1999. Yeah. And what did you study when you were there? I studied economics and mathematical statistics. Oh, that's right. I just read that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's get started. Let's not beat around the bush here. For our audience who doesn't know this, I learned about you and your university from a listener of the show, Aaron Appleton, who mm. works for you, who's a mm. learning experience designer, and I was very pleased to discover your work. I find what you're doing really inspirational, inspiring, and encouraging, I was saying. Thank so you. why don't you tell our audience, for those who are not familiar with you, who is Fred Swanica? Well, I would say that Fred Swanaker is just a humble servant of a big mission where what drives me is my passion and my love for Africa and a belief that Africa's people are its greatest asset, not just for Africa, but really for the world. And so I'm on a mission to unlock the tremendous potential that exists in Africa for the benefit of Africans and for the benefit of the whole world. And, you know, this passion comes from my experience of living and working in different parts of Africa, I've lived and worked in about 10 different countries in Africa. And when you spend time on the ground in Africa and with Africa's people, you can't help but be struck by just the tremendous potential that exists there. And so the question that's always been, been you know, on my mind is how can we unlock this potential? And, and so that's really the mission that I'm on. That's interesting. You can't help but be struck by the tremendous potential. Can you elaborate on that? Well... Everywhere you go in Africa, you see there's a difference in between financial poverty and poverty of the spirit. And when you go to Africa, you see people who are financially poor, but their spirit is very rich. They are driven. They are hungry. They are passionate. They all are striving for a better world because they really have no choice. They see they need to believe in a better possibility. And, and so when you are there on the continent and the other thing that is really that would strike anyone who goes to Africa is just the youth that exists in Africa because the average age of an African is 19 years old right 19.5 19. 19. to, to be exact, exact. Yeah. Exactly. and what can you tell us the statistics for China Germany the for United Germany States and, and Japan it's about 46 years old right yeah so and the nice thing about young people is that young people are naive enough to be still be optimistic mm. and they're naive enough to think about alternative ways of doing things and to imagine possibilities that others cannot. So therefore, they're, they're inherently more innovative and more optimistic and more passionate than you would see in most other places of the world. And so that, for me, is untapped treasure for the world because in a world that is faced with so many challenges, 
you need people who think innovatively and who are driven and hungry and want to find a different way of doing things to solve all these challenges for us. And so that's why I really believe that the world's greatest hope lies in Africa. Oh, I want to drive that point even further home because I have some of those demographics here, and I think they're important for our audience to take note of. Obviously, we know that the Japanese have very poor structural demographics, 46, as you said, Germany about 46 as well, the EU as a whole about 43, America 38, but China which has a billion people and which has sort of been the economic miracle of the last number of decades using the industrial growth model of the West is at 37.4. So we're talking about drastically different demographics in Africa and also very different institutional and infrastructural realities, which I think underlie the solutions that are possible and required. And we'll get into that when we get deeper into your learning model and sort of your entrepreneurial approach. Tell me a little bit more, though. I want to learn more about you. So where were you born? I was born in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And then at the age of four, my family left and we moved to Gambia, which is a tiny country in the middle of West Africa. And then at the age of eight, we moved to Botswana. And then while they were living in Botswana, they sent me to school in Zimbabwe. Why did you move so much? Well, Ghana had an excess supply of skilled labor. right? So there's a, a statistic I once read. I can't remember the source, which said that at the time when Ghana got independence in 1957, there was something like 22,000 university graduates in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, if you exclude South Africa. Of those 22,000, 18,000 came from two countries, Ghana and Nigeria. Mm. So the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, only had 34 university graduates when they became independent. So you can imagine, you know, nation- those, I'm sure those are all people that were part of the government that were the kids of sort of the ruling elite of that country. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I assume, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so as other countries in Africa were developing, if they needed teachers and doctors and lawyers and engineers, the place where there was some semblance of supply was Ghana and Nigeria. Mm. And so as a result, the Ghanaian professional class of which my parents were, my dad was a magistrate, my mother was a, was a teacher and a social worker, they were being given opportunities to go and work in, in other countries. And other countries were coming to poach talent from Ghana to help drive their development. Mm. And that was at, at a time when Africa, when Ghana's economy wasn't doing so well. And therefore, all of these talented people were looking for opportunities elsewhere. And so, so we spread, the Ghanaian diaspora spread throughout the world as a result of that. That's very interesting. Mm. So you came of adolescence in, what country were you in when you were an adolescent? In between Botswana and Zimbabwe. Botswana and Zimbabwe. Yeah. And you've mentioned in speeches before that when you were 18, I believe, you mm. lost your father? Actually, when I was 16. 16. Yeah. What was your relationship with your father? What was that like? I mean, what was that experience like? Well, my father, you know, both my father and my, my mother were a huge influence on my life in, in the sense that they really set very high expectations for me. So I, I vividly remember one day my dad, I was, you know, I don't know how, I must have been 10 or 11, and... Um, you know, he looked me in the eye and he said, Fred, you're going to be a Rhodes Scholar one day. Hmm. And I didn't even know what a Rhodes Scholar meant. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I went and I learned like, more about it. A, you're like, do you study roads <laughs> yeah, and infrastructure? Yeah, exactly. Do you study roads? <laughs> but what he was saying to me was that I see greatness in you and I believe that you can actually be great and that you can achieve something. Hmm. And, you know, that was the, always the spirit in our house. It was an encouraging environment. My parents had high expectations of us. They made us believe in ourselves. And this is one of the things that hugely influenced me and also that is now part of my educational philosophy because I believe that young people rise to expectations. If you believe in someone and you say that you are going to be great, you can actually achieve something, then those people develop self-confidence and then they start to believe because I believe actually that mm. we are limited only by the size of our dreams and by the size of what we think we can do. Mm. And so what my parents did and, you know, the influence that my dad had on me was really saying, you know, think bigger, believe in yourself. And that, I think, was a very powerful influence on me at that age. How many siblings were you? Four of us. Four. So, so I have three siblings. Three siblings. Yeah. When you said about that we're limited by the sort of scope of our ambitions or our dreams, that's absolutely true. I couldn't agree with that more. And even in athletic competition, I mean, the vast majority of people will give out at some point before their body gives out. Right? Exactly, exactly. And it's sort of a similar sort of thing. And your mother was a school teacher, correct? Yes, she and was. so as I understand it, there's something in your history before you left to go to the United States where you were appointed uh, a schoolmaster of sorts in the local school? Yeah, so what happened was my dad died when I was 16. 
And around that time, my mother was approached by several parents in the town that we lived in, Botswana, with the request for her to start a school for them because she had a good track record as a teacher. You know, she's got really good results. And so they said, you know, your kids do well in school. You're a great teacher. So why don't you start a school for us? And she said, well, my husband's just passed away. I've got four children to look after. They're about to go to university. I can't quit my job and start a school. But they kept pushing her. So she decided to to set up what she called a study group. So she rented a small building in a church. And then she had five kids that came and one teacher. And then one year later, the number of students had increased to 25. And by this time, I had finished high school and I had a year to wait before I went to college because of the way the academic calendar works in, in Zimbabwe versus the U.S. So during my gap year, essentially, she made me the headmaster of the school. And, um, you know, so for a year, I managed the school of 25 children. I, I grew to 50 kids. How old were these kids? They were in anywhere from 5 to 13 mm. and, uh, you know, in, in different grades. And I was the headmaster. I managed about four other teachers. I taught some class myself. I collected the fees from the parents. And, and then when I'd go home, I'd get advice from my mother about what to do the next day. <laughs> so basically, I ran a school as an 18-year-old as a headmaster. Let me ask you something. Mm. So you were doing this, you was in your gap year, right? Yeah. And you said you were going home and you were getting advice from your mother. What was your mindset during this time? I don't just mean that, you know, so yes, you, were, you had a job to do. And let's say you're a responsible young man or adult, however you want to say it, and you do your job. Separate from that, what else were you thinking about? Sort of where was your mind at? Where was your head at when this was happening? How did this fit into your larger ambitions? You know, you just sort of coming of age. How did that all sort of work for you? Well, at the time, I didn't really have any ambitions beyond just going to college. I was looking forward to going to college and, you know, I was thinking about becoming maybe a lawyer like my dad had been or an engineer. You know, as an 18-year-old, you keep saying, today I want to be a lawyer, tomorrow I want to be a doctor, tomorrow I want to be right. an engineer. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> you know, so that was all that was in my in my brain. And uh, it was a fun activity. Uh, you know, it was uh, something to do to while away. The time it was, you know, a responsibility that my mother had asked me to do and so I was just doing it. I had no idea that it was preparing me for what I would do later in life. And, and I mean, one of the things that I've come to believe is that many things happen in your life by accident or by choice that are actually preparing you for your destiny. And every now and then you need to pause and look back at all the things that have happened and see the thread of things that have been happening that have uniquely positioned you to do something almost better than almost anyone else in the world. Mm-hmm. So, for example, how many people had the opportunity by the age of 18 to have lived in four African countries like I had had. I had no choice in that matter. I didn't make any of those decisions. My parents made those decisions. You know, life happened and I moved, but that was giving me the pan-African view and the continental perspective that one day would shape my life. How many people have the chance to be a headmaster of a school at the age of 18? That also wasn't a choice I made. And then, you know, I continued. I went up to college in the States. I started my career with McKinsey, And then I started a biotechnology company and went to business school after that at Stanford. And when I was there, I did an internship between my first and second year at Stanford and ended up going back to Nigeria and met these wealthy families who were complaining to me about fees they were paying to send their kids to university, to high schools in the U.S., in the U.K. (laughs) And so at that point, I said, well... (laughs) That was back then. Yeah. (laughs) That was back then. Right. Now it's over $200,000 for four years. Exactly. So at that point, I said, well, why are these parents in Nigeria making such big sacrifices to send their kids outside of Africa? Why don't we have good schools on the continent that they can go to? And then I was like, well, I know how to set up a school. My mother, I did it with my mother when I was 18. And this, so, this is when you were at Stanford? This is when I was at Stanford. I was 25 at this point. Right. And so because of that small project that I'd done when I was 18, I actually had the audacity to believe that I could start a school. It was a much more complicated thing, much more, much bigger goal. We were going to try and recruit students from 54 countries in Africa and develop them into leaders and get them to top colleges. We would need to raise millions of dollars. It was a much bigger vision. But if I hadn't done that small project at age 18, I wouldn't even have thought that I had abilities to do this. And that academy then led later on for me to launch the university, which is now even much bigger initiative where we're trying to develop 3 million leaders for Africa. But I can tell you that I only realized my purpose in life five years ago Hmm. when I looked at all of these things that happened from Hmm. growing up all across Africa to being a headmaster at the age of 18 to 
starting different entrepreneurial ventures and educational ventures at smaller scales, you know, from the academy and so forth, and then to the university. That's when I realized that, ah, I'm uniquely positioned more than anyone else because of all these things that have been happening, that my destiny is actually to help to develop better leaders for Africa. That the one thing that I am being prepared for, that life has been preparing me for, is to be able to really unlock Africa's talent and especially its leadership talent. And that is now what I've come to realize is really my destiny in life. And I think that, and so my philosophy is that people should just sort of do what they're most passionate about at any given time and sort of let life happen. But every now and then you've got to pause and look back and see these patterns. Mm -hmm. And then you realize why you were put on earth. Mm. I have a quote from you right here. Greatness comes from passion. Someone can be very talented at what they do, but if their heart isn't in it, it's obvious. I believe that to be great at what you do, you need to be fully committed to it. I couldn't agree more with that. You'd have to be insane to do what's required in order to be successful if you didn't love it. You'd Absolutely. have to actually be like a sadomasochist. Because it's hard. <laughs> it's you know, I mean, insanely hard in the level of sacrifice. Also, I love what you said about not being able to connect the dots looking forward but only looking backwards. Mm. And that brings up a question also of faith and trust that the dots will connect, right? Yes, exactly. When you were young, before you had left Africa or right after perhaps you left and you were at McAllister, did you experience anxiety about your future? Did you have uncertainty at all? No. I mean, I've always... Is that um, a Western disease? <laughs> <laughs> I've always had faith. I'm not a particularly religious person, mm. but I have faith. And I believe that things will work out and that there's a reason why we're put on earth and that you have to believe. you know. And I think that many times when this faith has really been tested has particularly been in the last 14 years of my entrepreneurial journey. You know, So, for example, I remember, actually, it was in New York, 2005. I had graduated from business school, and I was in New York on a fundraising trip trying to build this African Leadership Academy. And I took a train from New York to New Jersey to meet a potential donor. And the meeting didn't go so well. I didn't get any money. <laughs> and, Brutal. Yeah. And I was so broke mm. that I didn't even have train fare to get back to the other side, to get back to New York. And I remember walking up and down on the other side of the river, of Hudson River, and seeing the skyscrapers on Wall Street and so forth. And some of my classmates from Stanford Business School were working in those buildings. And they were making $200,000, $400,000. And here I was with a Stanford MBA and I didn't even have enough money to get a train back. To this day, I still don't know how I got back. So I don't know what I did. Did I beg someone in the street or did I bump into a friend or what happened? But somehow I managed to get back. But I can tell you that during those moments, and I had several of those moments during those early days, I never lost faith. You never experienced fear, though? Those were some of the happiest moments of my life. Because in I retrospect, was, uh, in or even then, no, even because <laughs> that you were gleefully stuck in New Jersey, no. You're the only person, Fred, who, who would ever try to pull that one. <laughs> because I was working towards something. I had a, sure, I had a sure, dream, sure, 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 sure. and that dream was so motivating, right? That you know, of course, at that moment, I'm sure I must have been like, you know, at that specific moment, I probably wasn't happy. But <laughs> you know, if I think about happiness, I look at it not in specific moments in time. But in periods, and there's a big difference between fulfillment and happiness, mm. you see, because I think that you go through difficult times sometimes. And it's kind of like similar to if you ask someone who's running a marathon at mile 15, mm. are you having a good time? They're probably <laughs> like, oh, this is horrible. I'm not enjoying it. But when they're finished. Right. Sure. And you, you meet that person, they'll mm. be on, the, on, on cloud nine. They'll be like, I did it. This was amazing mm. and so forth. Right. So. Fulfillment for me, which then through several bouts of fulfillment, you get more sustained happiness. And so when I talk about faith, having a dream to work on, having something that is bigger than yourself, mm. that is what has taken me through to all these ups and downs over the last 14 years to get to this point where now we have raised about $200 million for the different ventures that you know we've been building to develop talent for Africa. We have almost 500 staff between the African Leadership Academy and the African Leadership University and Global Leadership Adventures. And we've produced 2,000 leaders and you know we're, we've got a model that's winning all these global recognition and so forth. But just 14 years ago, 
I didn't even have enough money to take a train back mm. from New Jersey to New York. Mm. And it's that faith and the passion working towards something that is so much bigger than me or anyone else that has taken me through all those moments. There's value in overcoming adversity. And I know it's not something that's adequately appreciated by the culture, mm. by society, you know? Mm. And there's value in courage, knowing that you had to dig deep and you had to find something and you had to hold on to it and you had to walk through the fire. Yes. You had to make it through to get there. Yes. It changes the value. But you've of the got to experience. believe that there's something better on the you other side. You do have to believe. There's, you've got to believe that it's worth pain to go through the fire to because the end on the other side of it mm. is going to be a so much a much better mm. world. Would you also say this interesting since we're talking about this, the way I've experienced it in my own life where I've had to overcome adversity, it was only a, at the point where I accepted where I was and I accepted that I was going to be here as long as it took and I was no longer concerned about when I would get to where I had to go. Yes. Where then it's the sky's part. It frees you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, you have to just forget about what people think about you. Mm. And I remember when I used to work at McKinsey before I went to business school. You know, if I went to a cocktail party and, you know, maybe you bump into an attractive girl and, and then she says, where do you work? You say you work at McKinsey. And they're like, oh, you know, McKinsey. And, you know, and <laughs> they, you know, they know that, you know, you get paid well and you fly around business class and they want to they wanna keep the conversation going. And after business school, um, when I would be at a cocktail party and they say, what are you doing? Well, I'm starting the school. You no know, one wants to hear no that, Fred. Hear that, no one wants to hear that wishy-washy shit, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fred. No and one then wants next to thing, hear that. They start looking around the room and <laughs> yeah. they, they move I, on. Trust me, I know. <laughs> no one wants to hear that, of course. And that's a really great point. Not only are there sort of traditional sacrifices, but there's also just the fact that in order to get there, you've got to be in the in-between. And the in-between exactly. is, is nowhere. It's nowhere. And, it's that, nowhere. and those are the moments when no one respects you, no yeah, one expects ooh. you. People think you're going to fail, yeah. and you have to just have faith. But but that's why the dream that you're working on must be so much bigger than you. Sure. Because if it is, then all of these things are irrelevant. All of these things that people say, all of the lack of material wealth, the lack of comfort is meaningless because you, you see something so much bigger. And that's what eventually allows you to become successful. But the slights can still hurt. Yeah, we've moment. talked about this. We had a recent episode with Josh Wolf of Venture Capitalist here in New York. We talked about exactly this. We talked mm. about the connecting the dots. We talked about, among many things, I had a picture of Michael Jordan in my rundown, and he had a speech that he gave when he accepted the induction into the Hall of Fame, mm. and he talked about how he had these logs that he would put in the fire, and mm. you know, he had really the way he kindled that adversity. Mm. Now, everyone has sort of their approach to that. Mm. But it's interesting hearing all of this. It's actually very valuable and informative, and I think it informs a lot of the things I've heard and read about your approach, one of which is putting problem solving at the center of learning. So generally speaking, what I like also about your learning model is that you emphasize learning how to learn, exactly. right, as opposed to learning facts and some figures. facts and figures. Well, the other thing I really want to get to, it, I don't know that it's, this is the appropriate moment, I love more than anything else and I really wonder how well it works. I really want to know this model of having the students teach each other mm -hmm. because that's a paradigm shifting thing if you can make that work. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to get to that. Mm -hmm. But you talk about what you're doing as a moonshot in education, right? Yes. Moonshots are now sort of this is a big thing. We actually are shooting rockets at the moon. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally speaking, given the exponential technologies we have, the moonshot model, whether you're an investor, whether you're a, an entrepreneur, people are taking these moonshots, trying to make massive gains in a very short period of time. What does that mean when you say that in the context of education? Sure. So it's coming from a point of saying really that by the end of the century, Africa will have 40% of the world's population. But even more alarming is that in just 17 years, so by the year 2035, Africa will have the largest workforce in the world. Now, 17 years seems far away. What is that? How many people? One billion people. One billion in and 17 this, years. In 17 years. And this will be bigger than China and bigger than India's workforce. Mm -hmm. 17 years seems far away. But if you convert that into days from today, it's about 6,000 days that we have left before we get to that point. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at it, there's two ways this goes. It's either a global disaster because you have a billion unemployed people seeking opportunities elsewhere, you know, clamoring over walls and, you know, this is a huge problem for the world, right? Or... It's one of the eras of great innovation and prosperity. 
And so the difference between the first scenario, the doomsday scenario, and the abundance scenario is education. 100%. Right? And so the moonshot is really saying, can we, in 6,000 days, find a way to rapidly skill this billion workforce that we will have in Africa, right? At different levels, at primary school, at secondary school, at vocational, at university level, and or in other ways of giving people skills. Can we find a way in 6,000 days to convert this latent energy of young, vibrant, innovative people into one of the greatest forces of prosperity and innovation that this century will see, right? And so a moonshot requires three characteristics. One is the task must seem completely impossible when you say it, right? Like when Kennedy said, we're going to put a man in the mood in 10 years, that seemed impossible at the time. The second thing is solving the problem will require a radical solution and completely unconventional way of doing it. You have to start over. You can't use existing vehicles because they just won't get there. And then the third characteristic of a moonshot is that it typically requires some breakthrough in technology, right? And that technology breakthrough must exist at the time in which you say it, right? Or it requires a breakthrough in technology to actually get there. So when I say we need a moonshot for education, I'm looking at it and saying, we have an impossible task, impossible seeming task <laughs> of upskilling a billion people at a scale and quality and speed never before done. It's going to require a completely unconventional way of doing it. But we actually have the technologies today that will allow us to do it. We just have to think differently and we actually have to completely reimagine education and we can get there. So one of the subheaders I have in, in my rundown here is the uh, necessity is the mother of invention. That's something that I have seen not only in your work, but in much of what has come out of Africa. I mean, the payment networks is a perfect example. The, exactly. The, the, yeah, mobile exactly. Money. Right. The mm -hmm. proliferation of that technology in Africa. And you make also the point about the weakness of African institutions. Mm -hmm. And the weakness of African institutions it has been a source of problems. It has held back the development of Africa. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that weakness can be a strength if, if, if you have the right leaders, if you have the right leaders because a leader can come in and his or her vision, if it's great and if they have the right the ambitions values, and values yeah. and everything, can accelerate change in Africa much and, faster than which would else. never happen in the United States exactly. or in Europe, for exactly. example. Exactly. Talk to me a little bit about that and how that informs your approach towards leadership because leadership is so central to your educational model. Absolutely. So. You know, I really believe that the impact that a given leader or an entrepreneur can have in any society, in a government, in you know, community, is negatively related to the strength of institutions. Because what are institutions? Institutions are checks and balances to your power, right? So whether it's the constitution or the judicial system or parliament or senate and all these things that the media, these are all institutions that hold leaders to account and check their power. And so if you have weak institutions, one leader can either break the society, which unfortunately has happened a lot in Africa, because there's nothing to stop them. But it also means if you're a good leader, you can really make a society mm -hmm. at a much faster rate than you could ever do in other parts of the world. So in the U.S., if you become the president of a country, you might think you're the most powerful person in the world, but you're not because you've got Senate and Congress and all these things that are going to stop you from <laughs> Public making opinion, things. Public opinion, the press. the press. You can't just decide you're going to print money. The Federal Reserve won't allow you to do that, right? Mm. Whereas in Africa, you don't have either of those institutions. So, you know, there's a downside of that, and we've seen all the downside of it, but the upside of it is that if you can get good leaders in place, then the speed at which development can happen can happen much, much faster because those good ideas can spread much faster. We can leapfrog, we can rapidly develop society, and this is what has happened when you look at somewhere like China or Singapore, Malaysia. You had a time where powerful leaders came into place. They had a good vision and they had good leadership skills and in a very rapid period of time they were able to drive massive change in their countries. And so what I'm saying is that if we can develop leadership and entrepreneurial attributes in the talent that we're developing, we can unleash this in Africa at this moment where institutions are weak to get them to drive rapid change. But one of the things that they must do is they must build the institutions. Right. They must create the checks and balances to their power so that after they're gone, 
you don't have to hope that other good leaders will follow them, but you've got a system that makes sure that you can continue these societies without having to depend on just leaders. One of the philosophical differences here between the African model, to say there's an African model, I mean, you know, there isn't some universal African model, but for the purposes of this discussion, the African, quote, African model versus, let's say, the Asian model of development is the increased emphasis on self-dependency of course, that was true in China, but it was driven so much by the central bureaucracy because they had such a strong central government, mm -hmm. and they wanted to use an export-driven growth model. Mm -hmm. So they were dependent, in a sense, on the consumers of Western. The rest of the world, right. yeah. But because of the technology that exists today, the way I see it, Africa is in a unique position to really dramatically reorganize what an economy even is and what a sort of governance structure is, and like you said, you talked about pan-Africanism, there is a sense in which what you're doing with ALU, ALN, and ALA is that you're almost like kind of creating a cultural framework for what it means to be African. You're absolutely right that technologies today allow development to take place at a much more micro level than in the past. So for example, in Africa, one thing that has really proliferated in the last decade is off-grid electrical power. Yeah. Right? Perfect. So before, if you need electricity in a village or, you know, in a town, you had to wait for the government to lay, you know, this massively expensive <laughs> pylon from the power station, you know, 500 miles away to come to your village. But with technology today, in its very tiny increments of capital, you can have a solar panel, and you can pay for it with your mobile phone using mobile money, and you're up and running, and you've got electricity. And that's you know bringing energy to thousands of rural households. Mm -hmm. And they've leapfrogged, and we're not building power lines, right? Yeah. And you know this kind of thinking, where people are taking development to their own hands, mm -hmm. right? Using technologies that exist and knowledge that exists to really skill themselves and to create businesses to come up with innovations, that I think is really where the possibilities lie. Mm -hmm. Because we can't wait for someone to do things for us. We have to do things for ourselves. Well, it's also a fertile ground for decentralized thinking, decentralized exactly. systems. Exactly. Not saying that we don't need good governance. We right. absolutely do. Right? But it's very, what you can do in Africa is reinvent governance. Yeah. You really can, right? Yeah. How many of these countries have anything close to non-artificial borders? Is it just sort of the northern countries in Africa? I mean, where... Yeah, every country has official... These, right. there, there was a conference in the middle of the 19th century that right. in Berlin where the colonial powers cut up the continent and they've created all these borders. So uh, it's not, not none of it is natural. I actually had... I don't know how much you know of African history. I'm curious. Before I started the show, I was interested in covering Africa. I have been. And uh, I have a friend, actually. Her name is Martina. She writes for the Wall Street Journal, and she's based out of Nairobi. Mm. She moved there years ago, and it's, fast. <laughs> it's amazing to see pictures on her Instagram. Mm. It really, it's like idyllic. But I was interested in pre-colonial Africa. I was mm -hmm. curious to see kind of what existed about that. And I have this one book, and I haven't had a chance to read it. It was Kingdoms of Africa, something mm -hmm. like that. I was just really curious to sort of explore what existed in Africa before the Europeans came there, mm -hmm. and the you know what sort of what were the most organized systems, societies, and where sort of and how all mm -hmm. that worked. But yeah, I mean, I think because of technology and everything we discussed, I think this is the first time where you have a continent or a sort of giant mass of people that can reinvent themselves but don't have to depend on Western institutions to sort of come in and create structure through nation states. This isn't like Woodrow Wilson's model of, of development after World War One. So why don't we get into the details of your approach? I have some things that I've outlined here that I like that you've talked about. One is that it's student-centered. Exactly. The second is, as we mentioned, it's problem-solving oriented. Yes. I like the third one a lot, which is that it costs close to zero. Exactly. I like that, <laughs> exactly. I like that one. Exactly. Um, talk to me about how your model works right now, and also tell us where you have learning academies. You started with a secondary school, right? Yes, we started with a secondary school last two years of high school in Johannesburg. We now have a university campus in Mauritius. We have another one in Rwanda. And we also have a business school in Rwanda. And then starting this September, we're opening a site in Nairobi. Ambition is to grow to train 3 million leaders for Africa. Mm -hmm. 
over the next couple of decades. Now, how much would that cost if you wanted to do that at Harvard Business School? I mean, Jeez. at Harvard uh, undergrad education, a four-year degree. If you a just four-year degree four-year. at Harvard today costs you two hundred forty thousand dollars. All right. So, if you right. wanted to scale that to three million, what is that? I can't do that math in my head, but you've it's, probably already done it before. Yeah, you know, trillions of dollars. <laughs> right. That's yeah. what we're talking. It's about. like one point two trillion dollars or something. like no, that. No, right? more than that, because it, just to train ten million people would be one point five trillion. Now we're talking about trailing, you know, three million. Wow. So I mean, yeah. So it's it's trillions of dollars, you know. Yeah. And so um, that's incredible, right? Yeah. I mean, that really is incredible because you're basically saying, look, this is the reality. We need to train all these people. Yeah. Like it's not going to work by sending them to our traditional schools, which cost a fortune. Yeah. And you know, just to drive this point, this is why I engaged in this material. And I was really interested to have you on, and I was so excited that you were by chance in New York this week, mm. because in America we're so stuck on thinking about how we need to sort of fix everything that broke because it worked so well and like we want to just, but like that's not going to work. The world is changing so rapidly and so quickly that if you really want to stay ahead of the curve and if you want to actually be relevant, it's not going to happen by funding some government training program that's going to train you to get the skills you need for the job you lost because they went to China or something. Mm. You've got to take control of your education. Exactly. You've got to take control of your own destiny. Because, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good luck on the whole thing. But, <laughs> you know, at least on education, right? Mm. Mm. Um, so, sorry, please continue. Yeah, I mean, so the way we looked at it is really from the perspective of it being a moonshot and in requiring a completely unconventional approach, right? So... We looked at the situation. We said we have 6,000 days to develop people. And we don't have any money. And we don't have many trained teachers, right? Or professors or whatever it is at different levels of education. So when I first looked at this, I thought, well, this is a problem that cannot be solved. I just couldn't see the way around it. But then we did an experiment at the African Leadership Academy that showed me what was possible. We were teaching a computer science class. But the class wasn't going so well, so we decided to scrap it. Then the next term, a group of students came and they said, you know, we really want to do computer science. So we said, well, hmm, we don't have a teacher, but we'll try an experiment. So we said, you can take an online class, but we didn't believe that online education alone would work because, you know, there are high dropout rates and so forth. So these students would get together and they'd watch the lecture. And when they got to a point, it was a class on how to build a search engine, right? And when they got to a point where they were confused, the ones who understood what was going on would explain to the rest. And the ones that explain it understand it better. Understand it much better, exactly. So they realized (sighs) that when they had to teach it to someone else, it would force them to learn it. So within a few weeks, these kids were learning how to code, and they didn't have a single teacher in the room. Amazing. So six months into the school year, I was sitting with a young woman from Morocco. Her name is Zineb. And I said, what are your favorite classes at the academy? And she says, my computer science class. (laughs) I said, what? How is that possible? There's no teacher in that class. And I said, how did you rate the class last year with a teacher? She said, six out of 10. I said, how did you rate the class this year without a teacher? She said, nine and a half out of 10. Nine and a half, huh? She's a perfectionist. She's like, listen, I'm not going to give you 10. But (laughs) nine and a half. So that blew me away. I was like, wow, we're able to offer a better class at zero cost. And then this girl graduated from the academy and went to Stanford to do computer science. Really? Yeah. Hmm. So this is how she got her base. And so I realized that I'd been thinking about the problem the wrong way. Instead of designing a system around a scarce resource, which is teachers that we don't have, we have to design the, the system around an abundant resource, which is brilliant students. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I heard, I've heard you say that again. Say that one more time. Instead of designing a system around a scarce resource, which is professors with PhDs and teachers, we need to think differently and design it around an abundant system, which is brilliant students. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need teachers. Teachers play a role, absolutely, and we need as many of them as we can get. But you need to, the role of the teacher and the ratio of the teacher to students must be completely different. And you need different types of teachers so that your learning system goes from being completely dependent on one person to being distributed, where students can learn by themselves, they can learn from each other's peers, they can learn from projects, they can learn from internships, they can learn from experts. And yes, you still have a teacher there, but the teacher's role is now just part of the learning system. Not They're not the only source of the learning, mm. right? And I think that, once again, technological breakthroughs have made this possible. Because when, for example, universities were created, you know, when Oxford was built, it was a thousand years ago, mm-hmm. they were established in an era when there was no information. Information was very scarce. You had to go to Oxford to get it from two places, the head of the professor or from the library book. Those are the only place you get information. 
And they were building bureaucrats. Mm. I mean, it was a bureaucratic, the yeah, uh, British were, Empire. They were, initially, they were creating people for the clergy. Right. And well, then, then later on for the British Empire and right. so forth, right? But today, we live in a world where information is ubiquitous. Mm. It's everywhere. Mm-hmm. A young person has more access to data and knowledge on their mobile phone mm-hmm. than someone who was doing a PhD 30 years ago mm-hmm. did, mm-hmm. right? So what that means is that it opens up completely different possibilities for education. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're tapping into. We're saying... In an era of abundant information, education is now something that can be student-driven. Students can learn by themselves. They can teach each other. And you can now have them apply that knowledge that they're getting by themselves and from each other to projects that they have to do. You know, you can think about assessments differently. You just you completely rethink education. What that does, it drives down cost, increases the speed of education at which you can move up people. Because now you've removed the key bottleneck to scale. And also, guess what? The students love it so much more because it's much more engaging. They're in control of their learning. They love coming to class now. And they love because the class is now with your peers and you're solving problems and you're learning by yourself and it's so much more engaging. There's no question that teachers can and do add benefit to students that are looking to learn. But I think a really apt analogy here that I've thought about and because also, you know, when I was introduced to you through Aaron just a few days ago, I was in the middle of preparing for an upcoming episode with a sports writer mm-hmm. for the Wall Street Journal on mm-hmm. his book called Captain Class, mm-hmm. which he basically explored for years all the different sports teams around the world trying to find the most elite teams and trying to find what they had in common. Mm-hmm. And it makes me think about sports here, right? Because kids, if you give them a ball, Mm -hmm. FEMA soccer ball, Mm -hmm. they can learn to play soccer. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need a coach Mm -hmm. to learn how to play soccer. Mm -hmm. They need some information to understand what a ball is, what you do with it, if you want to structure a game, Mm -hmm. what the rules are, all those things. And of course, it will be helpful to have a coach for many reasons, not just to learn the footwork and the technique, but also for the inspiration, for Mm -hmm. the father figure, for the mother Mm -hmm. figure, whatever it Mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. But you can do so much with just a ball and some basic information, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's sort of the parallel here. It doesn't seem to occur, I feel like, to almost anyone that the same principles that apply to sports, why can they not apply to learning? I think you said something very important. You used the word coach. So I think that the role of the teacher... I love that. ...should be much more like coach... I love that. ...than the person who's hand-holding you... I think of, this is freaking genius. You know, <laughs> I actually think this is pretty pretty amazing. And this goes back to what I was talking about in, in terms of the influence that my father had on me. The role of the teacher in the 21st century, I believe, should be less about giving you facts and figures. I love this. Than to ignite the passion for learning in you, right? Their job is to tell you that they believe in you and is to give you confidence and to build a culture so that you are self-reliant and that you can acquire things by yourself, and that you can learn things from your peers, and to actually believe in yourself and say, you know what, I can be great. Because I think half of the outcomes that we see from what's happening at the African Leadership Academy and African Leadership University is from things that we do, you know, formally. The other half is from things that the students do for themselves, and that comes from culture. So the role of the teacher in this world that we live in now is to really instill in them that culture And the nice thing about culture is that it's free. It's zero cost once you have it right. And it can then spread from one generation of students to the next. And then they say, this is how we learn. This is how we do things for ourselves. And so we do need teachers. It requires them to completely rethink and to actually give up control and to trust (sighs) Oh, I love that. Give up control. And also they learn how to collaborate. Exactly. So you've got a continent with problems, right? And how are you going to solve those problems? You're not going to solve them as individuals who are thinking, well, i got to beat Susie on tomorrow's exam so, no. I, can, so I can beat the curve and get my A exactly. minus or get my A. Exactly. That's not how you're going to solve your problems. I, no. You have to learn the skills of collaboration. collaboration. Yes. Exactly. So here, let's just skip right past all this because I think this is brilliant. My question is, does it work? <laughs> and how well does it work? And something else, right? Africa is its own continent with its own culture. I don't know how much the subcultures within Africa differ from each other, but it has its own particular culture and it has learning models that are particularly unique to Africans, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk first how well it's working and then how well do you think this could apply to Westerners? Mm -hmm. Like how would that work? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think this model is completely applicable 
to the rest of the world. You know, when I look at the phenomenal outcomes that we're seeing from the African Leadership University, I believe that we've come across not just an African innovation in education, but a global innovation education. And I'll talk to you about... No Austra- one else is doing this, something like this? I mean, there are people that do bits and pieces of this. Is yeah, anyone- different bits and pieces are coming together, but no one, has, I think, has pulled together all the different elements that we have where we've been able to get such high quality. Because I think that what we're doing, which is quite distinctive, is we're showing that you can get very, very low cost and very high scale, but remaining very high quality at the same time. Because to the extent that others are trying to bring education to Africa at scale, the quality is questionable. So they're putting this online education up there. Those and, things and, suck. And, if you and, just and, have online education, that's yeah. not good enough. And, the, and that's the thing, that this is not an online university. It's not good enough. Right? It's we're bringing people together. and they're, Because yeah. learning is a social activity. Right, yeah. You learn from each other. Absolutely. And, and you learn through projects. And all that. So it's the combination of all the things and also the way in which we've driven down the cost to the student because of the innovative financing that we have. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But two things to show you that that is working. One is our students coming, right? So one thing that was surprising to us, when we put this model out into the world and we opened applications, we had 180 slots for the first class. Within 60 days, we had 6,000 applications for those 180 slots. And what was most surprising to me was that 40% of the people who applied were in existing universities in Africa. And they saw how we were doing this and they said, I'm dropping out. Some of them were going to very prestigious universities. Some of them were even studying in universities in Malaysia. And they came back because they said, ah, this model of learning is what I've always wanted. We often design education systems without actually thinking about the user, the Mm. student. The student. And say, what do you need? And the fact that they voted with their feet and they left 40% of the people who joined us left existing universities. Some of them were in their final year of college. They had 40%? One, really? Yeah. That is impressive. Yeah. Really? Are you of serious? Of the inaugural class, 40%. Like, what colleges did they leave? I would never have guessed that. One of my questions was going to ask you, was there some way to do exchange programs? Because I thought, even for myself, I would prefer to have the degree of a Harvard or a Stanford as a student in this world right now because of the paper, if I was actually interested in that sort of thing. And yes, you're right. The people who are most risk-averse right. and the people who are on the safe path We'll take that. Right. But you see, the people who change the world are the ones who like risk. Right. The people who change the world are the ones who want to take the unbeaten path. Do things differently. And so the ones who chose to come in that inaugural class are innovators. They're problem solvers. They're leaders. And they said, ah, this is the place for me. And so we had kids dropping out of the University of Cape Town, right, which is one of the most prestigious universities in Africa. We had a young woman from Tunisia who had one term left to graduate. And she had already gotten admission to an MBA program in France. And she quit that and came to us. So that tells you something about just how right this model is for people in this time. The second piece of like to share in terms of how well this is working is our model requires our students to spend every year four months in an internship. So they come for eight months with us and then four months in an internship. We've cut out vacations. Mm -hmm. So by the time they graduate, they already have a year of work experience. So in the first batch, after the 180 came through our the first eight months of our program, we send them off into internships. Three of them were hired by McKinsey, one of the most prestigious management consulting companies in the world, as you know, including one working in Shanghai and McKinsey. One went to work in Paris with L'Oreal. So important. Two went to work in Silicon Valley. Seven went to work for IBM across Africa. Three went to work for Bain and Company, another top management consulting company. You structured all these these relationships? Yeah, we opened doors. Yes, and the reason we did that was not because we want our kids to work in investment banks and consulting firms. and so. No, we wanted to prove a point. We wanted to say, let them go and be tested at the most rigorous global companies that typically only hire kids from Stanford and MIT and Oxford and Yale and Princeton, all the top universities in the world. And we said, go and compete. And come back. And come come back, back and share this and with, so, which no, is what no, you've re- done, right? Remember, and remember. You've done this. this, this was, is, but this was during their first year of college. They still had three more years to go. Sure, but they're bringing back... I mean, it makes so much sense, and this model, it's fertilized by the quality of the students. Exactly. The students are the key driver of quality. Right. right? But what happened when they went into those internships was, you know, we asked the managers after the internships, we surveyed them all, and we said, tell us how our kids did. Compare them against college graduates that you typically hire from all these, you know, prestigious universities on a scale of one to five. so much better, I'm sure. How did our kids do? They rated our kids on average four out of five. Right. compared to college graduates. And they had only been there for eight months mm-hmm. with us. And then 
97% of the managers asked for another intern. And five of the kids got full-time job offers, including from some very prestigious companies. They said, you know what? You don't even need to finish the rest of your degree. From what I've seen from you already, I'm ready to hire you. Attitude is the most important thing for hiring someone who's fresh out of That's right. But the quality of the students that we had produced just in eight months when they went into all these prestigious companies was clearly evident when they were saying, we're ready to hire a bunch of your kids without them even finishing their second third They're problem solvers. They're problem solvers. They're innovators. They had confidence. They thought very differently. And what we found last year, our biggest problem was that we were flooded with the requests from companies asking us to train their staff because after they saw the students and they said, these skills that your young leaders have, we don't have them in our staff. So can you train our managers? So last year, the biggest problem we had is that we were turning away companies coming to us to say, can you train our staff in the same way that we've seen these students with the skills that, that they have? And so that for me is the best evidence so far that this model is working. Well, there's some famous psychological studies that have been done that show that children who are able to cope with adverse, not just cope with, but relish in adversity and in confronting challenges. Yes. And they don't view failure as failure, as a, as look as a learning opportunity. And, and as challenges, an opportunity to grow. Yeah. And that's like so, so, so essential. No, absolutely. And I'm, you know, I'm, part of our educational approach is that you learn going through hard things sometimes, right? So our objective is not to make the three years a smooth ride. We want to prepare them for a world where they need to have perseverance and resilience and courage. And so many of those, the experience that we take them through, we don't measure ourselves by whether our students are happy. We measure by how much they're growing and learning. And education is one of those things where you really have to think about what does your customer want versus what do they need? And what they need is to go through sometimes difficult times where their courage is built, they learn values, they learn perseverance, because those are the things that when they go on the world will actually distinguish them and will give them what they need to go through all those ups and downs to actually drive change. You know, I hope that the listeners can sort of meditate on this a bit, just to imagine, even from a spatial standpoint, how what a paradigm shift it is. Uh, I'm not going to make assumptions about how well this is working. I take your points at face value, but just on a theoretical level, if you have... 20 students, or in the case of college, you know, 400, sitting all with their backs to the wall and their face facing some one person who's at the bottom of, you know, this amphitheater, and they're just talking, and you're listening and writing down notes. The psychological shift between that group of human beings and one where they're all just mixing and matching with each other, figuring things out. Because as you said, not only are you learning, let's say, better being taught by your students, but then what about the additional learning that's happening from the people that are teaching the other students? Exactly. Not just the fact that they're learning the material better, which is totally true. You and I obviously have both experienced that. Mm. When we teach someone something, we learn yeah, it yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. But also, they're learning how to be leaders. They're learning, they're learning collaboration. Collaboration. They're learning problem solving. They're learning communication skills. These are the things that when they go onto the world will really make them distinctive. And they're learning things about themselves that they wouldn't know otherwise. Exactly. The fact that they're they want to help. Compassion. Right. Humility. Nurturing. Humility. Humility. Yes. Humility for sure. Yeah. Care. And also, I would hope, and I don't know how this would work, but you know, there's so much fear and the competitive aspect of learning is such a detrimental quality. I feel like... Exactly. Just... Because you see, I think we need to move away from this belief in the fixed pie and looking at the world of scarcity to really think of a world of abundance. A world, which is why, for example, when you look at elite universities today, they thrive and relish in the fact that they have thousands of applicants just so they can turn them away. Right? I mean, if you look at some of these great institutions. Absolutely. You know who did a great podcast on that? Malcolm Gladwell did a great podcast on that. I don't remember the details of it, but he did it. And I would suggest for anyone, any listeners, he has a, a podcast called Revisionist History. There's a specific podcast where he talks about exactly this point, that they make money from turning students away. Yeah, well, I mean, ahead. all these, you know, when you look at a quality of an institution, they talk about, oh, yeah, we have a 2% acceptance rate. So right, exactly. Yeah. Rate. They love that. <laughs> but... I've rejected so many people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but imagine how much more impact they could have on the world if they said, you know what, mm. we're going to open our doors. We're going to replicate ourselves. Because many of these universities that are doing this have billions of dollars in the endowment. And they could open more 
campuses. They could give access to more people, but they've chosen not to because the value that they think comes from making their products scarce. Yeah. And what we're saying is that we believe in a world of abundance, that we can actually give high quality education to millions of people. And the more we give that, the more the world prospers, the more opportunities created. There's enough to go around for all of us. And let's create opportunity for others, not create barriers for them. So I think that so many, this is why I think so many great inventions in practices, all sorts of things, ways of doing things, culture will come out of Africa in in these coming decades. Because you talked about control, you have to relinquish control. That may just be too difficult a requirement for Western institutions. You have entrenched interests. Universities aren't just going to give up their whole learning Absolutely not. You've got faculty who are on tenure who don't want to just give up their positions. People aren't going to do that. Alumni who... You know, say, no, that's not how I went to school. Yeah. You're not going to change that. Yeah. So there's a lot of real problems with legacy, right? You see, the fact that there's all this entrenched systems and processes and institutions means that it's going to be difficult to change. And yeah. in Africa, there's a clean slate. This is what's so exciting about what's there's going on There's a clean in slate and we can just leapfrog. And the point that it is really, if there's one thing that folks take away from this podcast... When we look at investing in education and thinking differently about developing talent in Africa and so forth, we shouldn't look at it as if we're doing Africa a favor and we're going to save Africans. They're going to do us a favor. You guys are going to do us. This is an example of you doing us a favor right now. I believe that many of the world's solutions actually lie in Africa. For sure. Because you have the 40% of the world's population is going to come from there. Mm. Because in that same population is the next Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a South Well, be careful. We actually did a few episodes on how he's in deep shit with, well, with Tesla. But still, he's an innovator, right? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Look sure. at the things he's come up with, Tesla and SpaceX yeah, and all He is literally right? taking PayPal, moonshots, yeah. You know, and he's a South African. Today, you can get a heart transplant because of a Dr. Chris Barnard who did the first heart transplant in South Africa. You know, Kofi Annan led the UN for a long time and, and you know, drove for world peace. You look at Nelson Mandela, one of the world's greatest leaders, came out of South Africa. The scientist who designed the Mars rover robot that NASA sent to the Red Planet is a Ghanaian scientist, right? So you have all of these people who, you know, have emerged from Africa, but they've emerged and have brought global solutions and global innovations by accident, despite the education system in Africa. So imagine now if you look and took a deliberate approach and said, we're actually going to invest in developing the potential of our youngest and most innovative segment of the world, how much more innovation is going to come out of that that's going to benefit not just Africa, but for the whole world? And like you said, necessity is the mother of invention. We have, because we have so many challenges that we have to solve in Africa and we don't have resources, it's going to necessarily force us to come up with the most innovative solutions. And the world, therefore, is going to benefit by really investing in Africa, not because they're going to save the Africans, but because this is one of the greatest opportunities to save the world. Mm -hmm. I want to actually hit something home there. I think that's a detrimental way of thinking. Whenever anyone was thinking, I need to save this person or I need to save this, or that whole dynamic, I don't even know how to describe it, is so counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Again, it brings us back to this point of collaboration. Instead of everyone's looking towards the teacher, teacher for the answers, we all turn towards each other. And we create solutions that we never imagined existed. Exactly. Another thing that I think is important to bring out here is the way we're financing this education. Because in the U.S. today, college students owe about $1.7 trillion of debt. And what we have been able to develop, what we are doing at scale with this university, is a different way of student finance, where the students pay almost nothing up front for their education. And we get investors who finance their education. And then when the students graduate, they don't pay back a loan with a fixed interest and so forth. They pay back a share of their income. Right. So what this forces us to do as a university is to make sure that our students get a job, or that they're highly employable, that they can become entrepreneurs. And the students are not saddled with debt. They just pay back a share of their income for 10 years. So it could be something like 10% of your income for 10 years and then you're done, or 10% of your income for five years. And so that's another thing. You should put a cap on that. Yeah. <laughs> there, is a, there is a cap. There's a cap. What's there the is cap? a cap. It's about three times. Okay. But... <laughs> what it means is that if you're unemployed, you don't pay anything as a student. Right. If you're working in a low-paying job, you're only paying a small amount. If you're working at Goldman Sachs or you know J.P. Morgan, you're paying a large amount. And everyone pays what they can afford. Right. So it's a much fairer form of student finance. And 
it's one that is really leveraging capital markets. It's sure. not requiring yeah. governments. Yeah. It's not requiring families who don't have resources. In itself is another great innovation in education finance, which the rest of the world can learn from what we're doing in Africa. And why not free all of America from college debt? I mean, isn't that something that, you know... It's a huge problem. Yeah. The, the debt is a huge problem. Yeah. No, I, I was familiar with that model. You have not implemented it yet, right? No, we've oh, implemented, implemented it. Yeah, we've already invested. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. we've got about 500 that. students who are already on it. Okay, really? Wow. Yeah, it's okay, live. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. What I want the audience to take away from this conversation is, at the very least, what I took away and anything else they can, which is that this is conceptually something that is really powerful and worth engaging with, and I would highly encourage our listeners to check out what you guys are doing. What is the easiest way just to go to African, to ALU's website? Yeah, aluducation.com. Aluducation.com. That's the website. And uh, I have a Facebook page where I write a lot about my thoughts. I'm on Twitter. Some members of our staff are also available on Twitter and in Facebook and so forth. But yeah, aluducation.com is really where you can follow the journey. I wish you the best of luck with this. Um, Thank you. I think you're doing great work. Thanks, Dimitri. Yeah, I think you're doing great work. It's been a pleasure to be on your show. Yeah, I know. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was my episode with Fred Swanica. I want to thank Fred for being on the program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stiganos de Colau. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. Thanks for listening. See you next week.